Yeah. So I'm going to start with something that that may be a bit of a curveball because it didn't happen in our country. It happened in the United States. Mm-hmm. And it's January 6th. Mm-hmm. And January 6th, which we all know is is the insurrection, the date of the insurrection on the Capitol building in Washington. And, and I'll tell you why I've chosen that for my first question, Marcy. Because the white supremacists, uh, the white power, all of the terrorist groups, the neo-Nazi groups that attacked the Capitol that day, and, they, they, and there were a lot of them. It was a throng of people who gathered from all over the United States. They gave us a compelling lesson that when it comes to discrimination, discrimination against blacks and discrimination against Jews, against the black community and the Jewish community, that we share, we share a common link because they didn't discriminate between us that day. They carried Confederate flags. They called officers the N-word. They wore Camp Auschwitz t-shirts. They shouted anti-Jewish, anti-black slogans. And so it, it was just this, this poignant moment, wasn't intended of course, where, where we realized um, that, that it is a common struggle if we ever needed to be educated about that. And, and it was interesting because I watched, as a lawyer, I watched part of the, um, the impeachment trial and Julian Castro, who was one of the house managers, actually quoted Prime Minister Trudeau, Marcy. And he quoted his comment after the insurrection, after the riot. And this was the quote that was introduced at the impeachment trial of the prime minister. Quote, what we witnessed was an assault on democracy by violent rioters incited by the current president and other politicians, a stinging indictment against former president Trump. So my question to you, Marcy, is I'm sure you watched that, you watched it live, you watched tapes of it, you probably mm-hmm. saw at least parts of the impeachment trial. What was your impression of what happened that day? Mm-hmm. I, I was deeply dismayed. Um, I was shocked. I was saddened thinking this is the seat of democracy. Th- this is the Capitol. And there's somebody holding the speaker's lectern They're smashing through glass. Somebody, there are people hurt, somebody died. And and all the while thinking, this is surreal, but it was real. And I have to tell you at the same time, my mind went to George Floyd and his killing and the protests that happened after it. People in the streets for weeks on end protesting and the arrests that were made and the violence that they met. And I immediately thought, Stephen, if these people, if these people were people of color, they wouldn't have survived this. That's where my mind went. They they wouldn't have survived it. And I thought that is the ultimate in privilege, you know, for people to call what happened at the Capitol a protest is the ultimate in privilege. And I heard people call it that. And it was an insurrection, as you say, it wasn't a protest. And yes, the former president was completely responsible, absolutely responsible. He told them to be there and they showed up. Do you think, did it, did it resonate in Canada as a concern of something that might happen here? Like a, with the politicians who you spoke to, and I'm not asking about private conversations, mm-hmm. but it's just general impressions. Uh, was there a worry or was it a sense that, no, that's, that's an American issue and we don't have to worry? About it? Well, here's the thing. When it comes, you know, when it came to the Capitol and what happened there, I didn't hear a lot of conversations about people worried, politicians worried uh, that that could happen here. But at the outset, and I will go back to George Floyd and his killing as, as the touch point, when that happened, there, was, there were a lot of conversations about people, you know, saying, well, at least we're better here in Canada, aren't we? At least this doesn't happen here. And, and a lot of people, a lot of black people, people of color rose up and said, no, we've got to wake up and, and we've got to see what's going on here because there is systemic racism and, and there are people that have been hurt and there are a lot of issues that we have and it's not just a problem in the South. So didn't hear it about what happened at the Capitol, but definitely heard it with regards to George Floyd and the whole idea that 
you know, that kind of thing doesn't happen in Canada. We, we have a gentler country, don't we? So, so Marcy, I just want to now take the time to uh, introduce your book. It's called mm -hmm. Off Script Living Out Loud by Marcy, and I've read it very carefully. It's a, it's a wonderful, intimate picture. And of course, off script refers to the fact you finally got the opportunity to be off script because yeah. on television, so much of what you did was on script. And, and I, yes. it was just an intimate journey that I, I really enjoyed. And actually, we're going to come to one of my questions, but you have an entire chapter devoted to the issue of a, of a police stop. But before yeah. I get to that, um, you, you, you are, and I know you're very modest, so I'm, I'm going to, to brag for you, but um, okay. you, you were a black female news anchor and the first black woman in Canada to co-host, not a morning news show, but the most successful morning news show in Canada's history. And you indicated in your book that you never felt you had a lot of room for error that you had to be great, not just good, but great every day to show that you deserve to be there. Mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, I was touched by that because I must say in all the time that I was with you, I never sensed that. I never sensed that you had this, this worry or this concern that if I didn't have that high mark, my job could be in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, let, we're going to have a very frank discussion tonight, Marcy. Um, and that's, that's, because of your race, because you're a, a black woman. And I just want to, I don't want to spend a lot of time explaining why that is. I, my question is, is that going to change? Do you feel a sense that we're moving forward, that we're going to progress beyond that, where we don't worry about someone's color, their background, their sex, their origin? Uh, I, I think so. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. But I think that there is a reckoning. I think we're at a point, and I, I, I do think that um, our stories as Black people in Canada are being heard. And I have to, I have to um, say a thing or two about that whole idea of being a first, Stephen, because it wasn't a pressure that anybody put on me. It was a pressure that I put on myself. And it wasn't even about, I don't know that I was even thinking, you know, job loss. I was thinking legacy. I was thinking, if I don't do a good job, maybe the next person that looks like me doesn't get a chance. They don't get a shot. Because when you're a first and you're walking through a door, you're bringing a community with you. And there's pressure that comes with that. And that's how I always felt. I always felt, you know, I want to be, I want to out-research everybody. And I want to do the best possible job that I can so that there are people that come after me. Kamala Harris said it just the other day, you know, she said, my mom said, you're going to be the first at a whole bunch of things, Kamala, but you're not going to be the last. And that's what it's about. It's about making sure that there are others coming next. All right. So let's, let's talk about Kamala Harris, because you actually allude to that, uh, not her specifically, but about Blacks being a position of leadership in this country, mm -hmm. in Canada. And you specifically write in your book that that wasn't the norm. And, you, and that was exposed to you when you went to Jamaica for a holiday with one of your friends, where it clearly was the norm, that juxtaposition, the contrast. But I'm talking to MP Ian tonight, mm -hmm. a member of parliament for Toronto Centre. So yeah. are we seeing it's, incremental it, changes to that? We're seeing, we're, seeing, we're seeing changes. And I'm here because you know, of, of people like Jean Augustine. And we mentioned Black History Month, it's the 25th anniversary because, you know, the Honorable Jean Augustine brought that motion forward and it was voted on and, and unanimously voted on. And that's why we celebrate Black History Month in Canada. So yes, incremental steps, but it's the reason I ran, Steve. It, it's the reason I ran because I wanted to show, you know, younger people in particular that this is possible and that it's important to have diverse voices at the table, at every table. So whether it's the political table, um, whether it's C-suites across this country, whether it's newsrooms, it's important that there's diversity there. If we're gonna represent Mar this country well. So Marcy, you, you refer to a number of important interviews that you conducted on Canada AM. There's a panoply of choices I could make. I'm gonna choose one. Okay. And you write about it um, having a profound effect on you. And I know that it's, it's something that will impact my audience tonight. And that's your interview with Max Eisen, uh, oh. this extraordinary man, this Holocaust survivor 
who wrote this uh, prize-winning book uh, by chance alone. And I just wanted you to express to everyone why it was so moving and profound for you to interview Max. I didn't want that interview to end. There are times when someone you're going to interview, you know, walks into the studio, it doesn't happen often, walks into the studio and all eyes gravitate to that person because there's a, there's a light, there's a light. And he walked in and he was like that. And I knew his story. I read his book. I actually brought, I have the book here because I want you to see all those years ago, all the notations, all the, all the notations, sticky notes, because I absorbed everything he had to say. But when he walked in, it's almost as if the whole studio was just kind of quiet. And he came and sat down so unassuming. And I said, what a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Eisen. I have so many questions for you. And we came back from commercial break and got the countdown. I think they gave me five minutes. I think Stephen, that day I blew through two commercial breaks because I, I doubled the time I had to. But the thing that we talked about, and you know, he told his story about being injured by an SS guard at Auschwitz and how he was dumped at you know, the hospital there. And you know, this kind, kind doctor saved his life, operated on him and then allowed Max to work with him and that saved his life. And I asked him, and I will never forget this about the title of his book, by chance alone. And I said, Mr. Eisen, is it really chance though? Or, or is it fate? Would you call it fate? Do you believe in fate? Do you believe that you're meant to be here? Be meant to tell your story, tell this important story of, of the Holocaust and survival and, and, and those that didn't survive and teach and educate, which, which he still does to this day. And he kind of bowed his head and then he looked up at me and he said, no, Marcy. He said, by chance, by chance. And um, I remember going to commercial break and I reached out and I grabbed his hand and kind of just held it. And I just thanked him. I, and I'm getting emotional now. Just, just thanked him for everything. You know, um, all of the people that he's educated the lives that he's changed in sharing about his life. And, and it's not easy to recount that kind of pain and torture and, and you know the murders and the death and all of that, but he does it because he wants to, that it never happens again. And I thanked him and uh, he is, uh, he's extraordinary, just extraordinary. So Marcy, you know those moments on Canada AM where uh, Vern, the producer, whisper in your ear, you got to cut this to two yeah. minutes because we yeah. have oh. something else. And we're going to do that now. We're entering a flash <laughs> round because I want to get as much as I can in the next 10 minutes or so that are left. Okay. okay? So okay. you can, as best you can, of course. I uh, will. But I, I'd like to see if we can get through a few questions right now. Well, here's, sure. I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with one that you can do with fairly quickly. Is there ever going to be a day where we're going to see Prime Minister Marcy Ian? Oh gosh, I'm I'm still getting used to MP Marcy Ian. So right now, Stephen, listen, it's all about the people at Toronto Center, and there's a lot of need, there are a lot of issues, and that's the focus right now. Right. I'm st really still getting used to that. I was a journalist yesterday. Okay, well, I just want you to all vote for you if you run for prime minister. That's all. So, so um, my next question is, what's, <laughs> what's it like to <laughs> what's it like to govern during a pandemic? I mean, you get elected and you walk in during COVID. Uh, I keep seeing you doing Zoom meetings. You haven't even been probably haven't been to Parliament other than the time you got your initiation. We're sworn in. Yeah, I, I went to Ottawa. I was sworn in, and I did a week of house duty, and then right. lockdown. Then lockdown. The biggest thing for me is that I like to connect. I wish I was, you know, there with you right now, you know, and, and there with everybody doing this interview. So it's the connection, the real connection of sitting across from people and, and listening to them and understanding, you know, what they need, what they want, the challenges. That's the biggest challenge. And we did the by-election during a pandemic too. So trying to, you know, explain right. to people why we wanted to serve and all of those things was difficult. I miss the connection. Okay, so again, next question. The first foreign leader that President 
Biden called was Prime Minister Trudeau, our Prime Minister. Uh, can you share with us any of the content of that call or at least what your understanding is the relationship between the two foreign leaders? There is no greater relationship than the relationship between Canada and the US. And bear in mind uh, that during the Obama administration, now President Biden was vice president. So the relationship was already there between our prime minister and now President Biden. You know, they, um, they talked about the pandemic. They talked about working together. They talked about issues such as climate change and, and you know, bilateral agreement. The biggest thing was that, you know, the United States and Canada, that is a special relationship. And it is further cemented um, between our Prime Minister Trudeau and, and Mr. Biden. They know each other well. Um, they, there's a lot of respect there. And um, I think we're going to see a lot of good things coming out of that in the years ahead. Okay, well, here, here's a question that will be very important to our audience. What's the liberal, liberal government's position presently towards the state of Israel? Well, you know, Stephen, Canada and Israel have enjoyed close ties for, for decades and cooperated on multilateral affairs on multiple fronts. Canada is a friend to the Israeli people. And, and I know that we hope to strengthen those ties with uh, bilateral trade agreements and um, investments to partnerships, and that isn't going to change. Okay. You devoted a chapter in your book. Again, I'm going to hold it up for everyone. Off script, Living Out Loud by Marcy Ian. This was written before you were elected, I might add. Um, you devoted a chapter in your book. It to was just stop. before. Just before, I know. To a yeah. police stop and then um, an op-ed you wrote for the Globe and Mail. Why did you think that it was important to, to write that chapter? because you know, things happen and people don't talk about them. And if we don't talk about them, there's no change. And I thought, you know, me picking up my pen and writing about my experience is going to create some discussion. And it did, it, it went viral. And I have to note that a lot of vitriol came my way. A lot of people accused me of, you know, using my race and lying and all these things. But the one question, that people didn't ask was, why were you scared? You know, why, why, why were you scared that night? And that's a loaded question. It is because there, there's, there's trauma. There's trauma um, that, that many black people, I would say most walk around with when they've seen people in their lives stopped by the police um, for no apparent reason, hurt, I've got, you know, a lot of friends and family members that this has happened to. So already that's there. So a stop is never just a stop. And it was in my driveway. I was home. I was in, you know, a place where, you know, I, I, I and, and I wasn't. And it rocked me. And I had to write about it. I couldn't not write about it. As a Black woman being stopped for, by the police, as you perceive, because of the color of your skin, right? Well... Well, here's the thing, Stephen. The officer that night stopped me on the driveway and I got out of my car and he didn't let me know why the stop was happening. And it wasn't till I got back into my vehicle that he let me know that I didn't stop at a stop sign that was just down, down the road. And I said to him, that's fine. You know, if I didn't stop, you know, fine, give me a ticket and and that'll be, that'll be the end of it. But there were so many other things that happened. His tone, which is why I was scared, um, you know, uh, ordering me back into my car, which is why I was scared. Um, those, those are the things where race comes in. It wasn't, he stopped me, you know, because I was black. It's, he treated this, me this way on my driveway and questioned if I lived where I lived because I was black. And bear in mind that I had been stopped several times in my own neighborhood, several times. And, and the question was always, is this your vehicle? Do you live around here? And that's not right. 
Okay, so we have two questions, time for two more questions. And one okay. goes to, to um, the underlying philosophy of your life that your father taught you. And you can see that I read your book carefully. And it's um, an incident you, you describe as a 12 year old girl. Your father was a, high, a school principal and you came in on a PD day, a professional development day. And you saw your father hold up a tombstone and asked what the most important part was inscribed on that tombstone. What was the answer he gave and what was the reason yes. for it? The answer he gave was the dash. He said the smallest part is the most important part because it represents what you do on this earth. It represents your legacy. And this is, um, this is how I've always tried to live. Um, that was a speech that my dad gave to every class, every school that, that he's a principal at. And um, I remember sitting there that day and hearing it actually named our son Dash because of that. And it's just thinking about who you impact, leading with empathy, who and what are important to you. What difference are you gonna make in this world? That's the Dash. So, so I just want you to know something, Marcy, because I'm going to tell you that that is a Jewish theme. That is a principle is of Judaism. Yes, it's called tikkun olam, repairing or mending the world. And that uh -huh. dash that you just described is a, a fundamental Jewish principle. So we started on a common bond of the Black community, <laughs> Jewish community, and we end on it. So there you go. I love your that. Father didn't know that. So here's my last question, because I know oh. if we had a chat box operating, that yes. this question was asked. And I, and I really want you to address it. Um, you know, as frankly as you can, because it's so okay. important. It relates to the pandemic. It relates to, to the scourge of COVID that's afflicted so many, that's led to so many deaths, so many sick yeah. people. And that is, you know, when can we realistically expect the rollout of the vaccine? Because you know that Canada has described, there was just an article, the Washington Post, how slow we are. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of criticism directed. You know, I praise the prime minister. I praise your government. There's a lot of criticism out there now. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if you, I want you to, to address that frankly and candidly for our audience, please. Absolutely, absolutely. I wanted to make sure that I had the most up-to-date numbers um, because I need to be as honest as possible with everything. And, and this is not to say that there weren't supply chain issues. There absolutely were. And that's what slowed us down. But we are on track now. So 6 million vaccines by the end of March, 23 million by the end of June, and by the end of September, 84 million. And what that means is that everybody who wants the vaccine will have the vaccine by the end of September. So while things haven't been or haven't moved as quickly as we wanted them to, they are on track now and more than on track now. So people will start to see a speeding up, a speeding up and through March and then June and then by the fall, uh, we'll be there. And, and that urgency, is something that, the, yeah, we'll be there. And the urgency is felt by the government, the understanding. Absolutely. Ab ab Listen, nobody's sleeping right now, Stephen. You know, I can tell you the prime minister the procurement minister, Anita Anand, you know, the health minister, Patty Hyde, everybody is working around the clock. Everybody is working around the clock. We really are all in this together. Everybody has been impacted by this pandemic. And so we're working together to make sure that Canadians are taken care of. And by the end of September, we will be. Okay, so Marcy, the, the reversal of role took place. I interviewed you tonight. Yeah. I wanted to thank you so much. Usually you're the one thanking me. So this is no. uh, my opportunity with, with love and with pride. I'm so, I'm so proud of what you've accomplished. And you know, you know uh, that I view you as a dear friend and I know you feel the same way about me. And I, and I want to speak for everyone here, uh, thanking you for, for party. I know you have to rush out and it's important. You have a lot of important functions, but you took the time to spend with us. I managed to get all my questions in, by the way. And, yeah, I'm so uh, glad that you did. Yes, and thank you, Marcy. And, I, and we're going to continue now. We're going to show the full video, by the way. Of, oh, of our please camp. go ahead. No, but you're the great. No, you're the greatest. You always answered my questions. You always came in 
so well researched and then you shared above and beyond. I always loved it. You're my favorite, Stephen, you know that. And listen, sending you all the love. Thank you for the support. I really appreciate you and uh, hope to see you when things open up. Thank you for inviting me and thanks to everybody uh, for, for being here. It's really a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you very much, Marcy. I, everyone's clapping. You don't see it, but their hands are oh, moving together. Oh, thank you. You touched the core. Thank you. You've touched the core. Okay. Uh, so we're going to show the video. Thank you, Marcy. Go okay. do your go do your work. Okay. And so again, let's go. Let's see the video now. Three family members convicted of first degree murder in 2012 are asking Ontario's highest court for a new trial. Mohammed Shafia, his wife Tuba Yaya, and their son Hamed were convicted of murdering the family's three daughters and Muhammad's first wife in 2009. The crime was widely referred to as an honor killing, with prosecutors arguing the daughters were murdered for bringing shame to the family. Legal analyst Stephen Skirka joins us now. And Stephen, want to zero in on the expert witness and the grounds for this appeal. Well, that's going to be the core of this appeal when it's argued by very capable lawyers, Marcy. And essentially, the argument is, look, this expert should never have been allowed to testify at this trial. She engaged in cultural stereotyping. We have to be very careful when we're dealing with vulnerable minorities to engage in this kind of what they call cultural caricatures. How so? And, because what they're saying is, look, these people um, are just being judged on some stereotypes that are false and we should never, has no place in a Canadian courtroom. The notion here that expert testified that in some cultures, primarily in the Middle East, honor is valued above human life. And of course, the jury was entitled to take that and apply to this case. That's going to be the core argument. But there are other things here. As I recall, uh, the father, Mohammed Shafia, there was a wiretap. There are other things here that helped this, this case. Is, this is an an overwhelming case, including incriminating police statements, wiretaps. Let's not forget the physical evidence, evidence the of cars. a broken headlight found at the scene of the crime, the locks indicating that both family cars were there at the time of the crime, uh, apparently in a collision consistent with one car pushing the other car into the water where the, the four people were found drowned. But, you know, I, I do want to say this about the honor killing ground, Marcy. It's very important. I think it's, it's a weak ground and it's doomed to fail. Because imagine this case without the expert witness. You'd have a, a situation where these family members are killed in the most cold-blooded, calculated way. They're found drowned, submerged in a canal. Why would family members do that, including three daughters and a sister of the people who are found guilty? Crown isn't required to prove motive. But surely it was vital in this case. And what that expert did is it supp she supplied for the jury the possible motive for the crime. And that was why I think it's absolutely vital that the jury hear this in this case and why I predict this appeal is doomed to fail. If there were to be another trial, though, would they then call another expert witness such as this? Well, the, the defense lawyers are arguing on this appeal, Marcy, that there shouldn't be an expert testifying about this. And so that it would, the trial would be stripped of this, this kind of testimony. Um, and so this, this notion that a family member is entitled in some cultures where they feel the honor is being threatened to kill the offending relative, that expert evidence will be absent for the trial. And then a jury will not have any evidence of a possible motive. But it's not going to happen. The jury deliberated for what? 15, 15 hours, hours uh, over a three-month trial involving uh, three three different accused with several counts of first degree murder. They had absolutely no difficulty coming to the verdict in this case. And the Court of Appeal will be influenced by that as well. Stephen, thank you My so pleasure. much. Okay, so, so there you go. How many times uh, did I say the appeal was doomed to fail, that there wouldn't be a new trial? I, I wonder if you were counting. And um, that ultimately was happened. The, uh, the appeal was resoundingly um, dismissed. And for the reason that I gave there, because, and it's so important, this, this notion of honor killing, because without, without the introduction of that expert evidence, who knows what a jury would have done looking at this baffling situation of family members killing others. One of the interesting things about this case, though, that I didn't have a chance to go into on Canada AM, is it actually reminded me of a very, very famous case that Clarence Darrell 
defend it. And it's the Leopold and Loeb case in the 1920s. And Leopold and Loeb were these two upstanding young men from wealthy families in Chicago who came, who came together and decided um, to create the perfect crime, the perfect murder. And they lured a 14-year-old boy, killed him and dumped him in a field. And just as that broken headlight was found at the locks in Kingston from the car of Mr. Shafia that led directly to Mr. Shafia, uh, so to the incriminating evidence by analogy that eventually led um, to the convictions of Leopold and Loeb, although Clarence Darrell saved them from execution, was that one of them had their head, their eyeglasses, and they were very, with a very unique set of eyeglasses, fall into the field. And that's what most incriminating evidence was against them. So we're going to continue just, but I want to let you know I'm opening up the chat box now. So if you have any other questions, um, you know, we didn't have the time, unfortunately, with Marcy because I, I had to, to, to struggle to get all my questions in. But I want to talk to you about making predictions in legal cases because I thought that would be of interest. And this is something that I, uh, I decided to do early in my, my legal career. I was the, the first legal journal, legal analyst in the country, um, Nash for at least for a national television network. And I started around the time of the Paul Bernardo case. And I just decided on my own that I would make predictions. Um, you know, as I told my father, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, you know, but at least they'll be reasoned and people understand why I make them. So I wanted to tell you about a, a couple of predictions that I made and they were interesting and explain to you why I made them. So the first is um, the Martha Stewart case. And you'll remember it was an, an insider trading case and ultimately she went to jail for about a year. And, um, you know, and everyone, and I mean, everyone was predicting that Martha Stewart was not gonna go to jail. They'd watch the OJ Simpson case. She was a celebrity, she was famous and it just wasn't gonna happen. And I went on national television. I remember doing it from Nova Scotia. I was at a conference there and I, and I went in, in a cold wintry morning and made the prediction that Martha Stewart was gonna be found guilty. And I remember Seamus O'Regan, uh, who also was an MP now, said, well, why, Steve? And I said, well, Seamus, it's a crime of dishonesty. She's charged with a dishonest act. And she has to get up there and say she didn't act dishonestly. It's one of those crimes. And again, you can't say it, it happens all the time in every case, but a jury or trier of fact, a judge, needs to hear from the person charged to say that they weren't acting dishonestly. And the other thing that was puzzling was you had, other than Oprah Winfrey, probably the most eloquent person imaginable to tell their story. I mean, who could better express a story than someone like Martha Stewart? So what do you think the jury thought when Martha Stewart didn't get into the witness box? And why wouldn't Martha Stewart, if she had a defense, get up there and tell it? So I made that prediction, I was right. So the second one was Conrad Black. And there's an interesting story of, of why I came to make that prediction. Um, and I'm just looking at one of the questions. I, I have to laugh. It's, it's how come you haven't aged since that interview? Botox? No, I, I, um, David, I, I haven't used Botox, but thank you for that, that nice compliment. It made me smile. So, so this is what happened. I was on a television show in Chicago because I, I stayed in Chicago for the trial and, and wrote a book about it. And it was called The Verdict. It was a new show that was starting at the same time as the Conrad Black trial. And Paula Todd was the host. So I had done my interview and I was just standing around the studio after I finished, took my microphone off and I'm ready to leave. And the producer came up to me and said, Steve, you can't go. And I said, why not? He said, well, our next guest isn't here and we need to fill another six minutes. So we need you on again. I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? He says, well, why don't you just say what you think is going to happen in the trial? So there I am on national television, you know, and again, and again um, there was a predominant view uh, that Black was going to be found guilty. And I don't have to tell you the vitriol that existed surrounding the trial, at least at the beginning. And I get up on national television. I still remember the phone call of my father, you know, my dear father saying to me, what did you do? And I said, um, not guilty on every count. 
And so, and in the end, I was largely vindicated after the series of appeals and everything. He was left with, you know, um, uh, 1% of the total amount of the fraud alleged and, and a, an obstruction of justice charge. So, you know, out of initial charge of $84 million. So, so here's the interesting story. So the next day I go to court in Chicago and there was a journalist from uh, England named Tom Bauer. And Tom Bauer came up to me and, you know, asked me to speak to him privately. I said, you know, of course, sure. He said, Steve, have you been talking to one of the jurors? I said, no, what are you talking about? He said, you seem pretty sure of yourself last night when I was watching on television that you seem to know he's going to be found not guilty. I said, are you kidding me? I'm going to go to jail, lose my career, you know, lose my reputation, my good name, everything, so I can make a good prediction on CTV. So, you know, one of the interesting things about Tom Bauer was, because the English press was, was, you know, most antagonistic towards Conrad Black. But one of the things that puzzled me, and I wrote about it in my book, was, you know, how would Tom Bauer allow to be covering this trial of Conrad Black? Because he had written a book published by Harper Collins that, you know, was just so salacious and so full of gossip and so full of, you know, lewd imagery uh, against Conrad Black. And Conrad Black had sued him before the trial and Harper Collins, a case that eventually is, is withdrawn and dismissed. But at the time it was live, it existed for about $20 million. You know, and I remember thinking to myself, how do you send a journalist to objectively, clinically cover a trial of someone who's suing you for $20 million? I mean, it just seemed to me that, you know, just courts disaster. So anyways, that's, that's my, um, my Conrad Black story. But, you know, routinely, I would make, make predictions. And um, so let's see if we have, do we have any more questions um, as I continue? Because I want to talk about something else, which is uh, the police stop that, that Marcy described. But if you have any questions about anything before I come to that, you know, just put them on the box now. All right. I'll just give you a moment in case anyone has a question. All right, so let's let's talk about the police stop because you know it took a, it took a lot of courage for Marcy Ian um, to write that chapter, and one of the things she didn't have time to describe is that the chief of police of Toronto actually wanted to speak to her alone, and she insisted on having someone come with her, and he chastised her. He took her and he 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 took her to task and said, "You're just wrong. That wasn't racial profiling." That didn't that stop didn't occur. Those stops didn't occur because you're a black woman. And to Marcy's credit, she stood firm. And you could see the passion. She was traumatized uh, by these stops. And again, I want to be very clear. I'm not condemning the police. I have huge regard uh, for the police. We're talking about individual police officers who engage in racial profiling because of a systemic racist problem in this country. And it exists. And so I wanted to tell you about my contribution um, to this issue because it merges uh, with Marcy. Um, you know, I've been practicing criminal law for, for many years, uh, you know, about three decades. And the one case that stands out among all the cases that I've ever defended or done is the case of Dee Brown. And Dee Brown was a member of the Toronto Raptors. He was known as um, Three Point D. He was... Um, the uh, slam dunk competition winner in the NBA All-Star Game in his rookie year. And, and Dee Brown was um, coming home from a Halloween party at Antonio Davis's home, another member of the Raptors at the time, got stopped by the police on Don Valley Parkway. He was wearing a hoodie and a very expensive car. And the position it ultimately found to have um, over the legal limit of alcohol in his system as a result of his stop. And the position I took at his um, trial was that he was stopped by the officer because he was a black man, because the officer engaged in racial profiling. And that as a result, it was a violation of his constitutional rights, arbitrary detention. The results of the blood alcohol reading should be uh, thrown out and the case should be stayed. And so, you know, I went to trial and I had a, a very belligerent judge who resisted my um, position from the beginning. The legal term, I can see, you know, Stanley in the audience, he'll know what I mean, ab initio, which means from the very beginning, the Latin term. I had a judge who, who was resisting my position, wondering what we were doing here, why I was importing uh, this American notion of racial profiling. 
and I took a pummeling. And, and what you have to do as a lawyer when you get take a pummeling that's unwarranted is stand firm. That man, that woman in that courtroom has to maintain the record and preserve the record. And I did, but it wasn't easy. So ultimately that case, the case of Dee Brown became the landmark racial profiling case in the country. And, um, and I argued the appeal with a brilliant lawyer, Phil Campbell, you know, one of the best lawyers in the country. And it's now the, the standard case taught in law schools across the country, every racial profiling case, every case dealing with systemic racism, the starting point is the D. Brown case. And that's why I'm so particularly proud of it. Again, I go back to what I said to Marcy about tikkun olam, about advancing social justice. And, and it isn't just, of course, blacks it refers to, it's really any visible minority. And, and it's, it was a transformative case in this country. And, and you know, Marcy took a lot of, um, lot of, a lot of flack um, and heat for, for doing that case. So I just wanted to share with you a story that I've only shared once before. And um, at the time that I did the Deep Brown case, I defended police officers. I was probably their top lawyer at the time. I defended about 25 police officers and never lost a trial. Uh, I had introduced demonstrative evidence um, once I'm very, and I'm not doing it to brag, it's just to make the story that I'm about to tell you more impactful. And, and I was given um, the top cases and I was viewed as, as, you know, just a great lawyer by the, the police union and the police. And with that said, in the middle of the D Brown case, in the middle of the trial, I got a call from the head of the police union or lawyer with the, uh, Craig Brahma was the head. It was, a, it was one of his underlings, a very angry phone call. And he said to me, I'm off the list. And being off the list, man, I would never defend another police officer again for the rest of my career. I said, why? He said, because you're, you're claiming racial profile. You're arguing the police are racist. I said, I'm not arguing the police are racist. I'm arguing the one police officer one police officer in my client's case engaged in racial profile. And he may have done it subconsciously. It may, have, it may have been just a series of factors operating in his mind, not consciously, but the effect was the same. But the resistance, the anger, the rancor, and, and I calculated that over the course of my career, that cost me well over a million dollars of income, well over, um, because I would have been defending those cases every year. And I know what I was making before then. And I just want you to, to tell you that I've never regretted taking the D. Brown case and the choice of a million dollars, a gazillion dollars against advancing this issue of social justice um, is a mismatch for me. I would take the D. Brown case in, in, a, in a flash of light any time again. So I just wanted to to share that. Does anyone have any questions for me? Because we still have about 10 minutes. Um, I'm happy to, to answer anything, anything relating. I thought the interview with Marcy was, was really extraordinary tonight. She's, you know, what, what a wonderful person to have representing our, our country as a member of parliament. So um, if you don't have any further questions or, you know, 10 minutes left, I, I wanted to thank everyone for being here. Again, tell you, Brett Stevens, wow. You know, what a guest we're gonna have uh, the next session, March 2nd. So please tune in uh, March 2nd, Tuesday, 7 p.m. Thank you again for being with us, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you for being on the program, Evenings with Steve. Good night.